I'm Sarah Smith, the biological oceanographer here at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Ty Tyler Cyrenak, um, on behalf of Max Grand in the Chemical Oceanography Lab. Tyler has been an assistant professor for some time now and founded the Coastal Carbon Laboratory in 2019. He's currently at the Institute for Coastal Plain Science at Georgia Southern University and was previously at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. Prior to that, Tyler did a postdoc at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And prior to that, he was at the Southern Cross University in Australia. So he's been lots of very beautiful, very cool places. Um, he earned his PhD there in bio, biogeochemistry after first earning a master's degree at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Tyler's primary research interests include marine biogeochemistry and the carbon, chemistry and the carbon cycle, submarine groundwater discharge and coastal ecosystems, as well as environmental change at the global scale. Tyler is also interested in the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or CDR, through sequestration in the ocean, a growing field referred to as MCDR, and a really interesting topic. Excitingly today, Dr. Cyrenak will expand on this topic in his seminar titled Harnessing the Dynamic Ocean Weather of Coastal Ecosystems for Marine Carbon Dioxide Removal. And with that, I'd like to welcome Tyler to Moss Landing virtually, and I will turn the floor over to you. Okay, well, thank you so much for that introduction. That was great. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about carbon dioxide removal through a project I worked on recently with the World Ocean Council, which I'll explain in a little bit what that was about. And then also at the as the second half of the talk, really think about how we might be able to use um, coastal ecosystems and their unique sort of biogeochemistry and seawater chemistries to help with this um, removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So to start out, I just wanna tell you a bit about this project. So this project was something I worked on um, over the past four months, and it was run by the World Ocean Council, which is an international cross-sectoral business leadership alliance that deals with uh, corporations and industries that use the ocean in some way or another. And we were put together um, by a, a bunch of different funding sources. Climate Works was really the main funding source for this. And really, we were tasked with developing a generic business case for marine carbon dioxide removal and really two specific processes, which I'll talk about in, more in a second. And I was the scientific advisor for this process. So I was really working with the people outside of my expertise and really outside of my scientific hey, Tyler. expertise. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Um, you're not sharing your screen yet. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Okay. I was mostly impressed that you were going to do it without slides. It's been a dream of mine. <laughs> I, know. I don't really know if I want to try that. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Could everybody see it now? Yes. Um, all right, great. So sorry about that as a rookie Zoom mistake there. Okay, so <laughs> this was the slide where I was just describing what this project was. So I just want to describe sort of what a what our result was. So really what we came out with was a PowerPoint slide deck that could talk about ocean alkalinity enhancement and electrochemical processes and the role in carbon dioxide removal to a generic audience who might be interested in investing or businesses who might have similar interests as some of these startup companies in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and maybe they have infrastructure that could help. So first, why develop a business case for marine CDR? So it's becoming carbon dioxide removal in general is becoming a very popular thing. If you haven't seen it yet, you will soon I, uh, outside of this presentation as well. And really what the, the project wanted to do was to increase awareness, awareness and facilitate engagement between this emerging industry and target audiences, as I just said. So that was really the purpose of this. So a lot of these slides are not gonna be traditional um, science type stuff that you might be used to be seeing in these presentations. Although towards the end, I'll, I'll gear towards more what my laboratory does. And anything that was generated from this project, you'll see looking like this with the World Ocean Council logo up here. So these are slides that were actually part of the final product that we ended up creating. And then anything that doesn't have that is a slide that I put in there myself. 
for something that I might have wanted to expand it on. So really CDR got underway um, when this 1.5 degree special report came out from the IPCC. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is world-renowned um, international group of scientists and governments working to get to the state of the art science behind climate change. And they had this statement, all pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees cent centigrade with limited or no overshoot project the use of carbon dioxide removal on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide over the 21st century. So what does that mean? It means the IPCC is telling us that we need to do carbon dioxide removal if we have any chance of hitting our target goals of 1.5 and now probably even two degrees Celsius. So this is something that really spurred on the generation and the thought of these carbon dioxide removal companies. And you can see it here in the chart showing greenhouse gas emissions um, and CO2 equivalents per year. And these net negative emissions are what equate to carbon dioxide removal. And so CDR refers to any activity that's going to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs, or maybe even products. Um, so it's quite different from CCS, and the next slide is going to sort of explain this. So you may have heard of carbon capture and storage, and you may have heard of carbon dioxide removal. And the difference isn't necessarily in the technology that's removing the carbon dioxide. It's really where you're getting the carbon dioxide from. And this is really critically important because carbon dioxide removal is taking old emissions out of the atmosphere. So it's taking emissions that have accumulated in the atmosphere out and storing them somewhere else in the earth. Carbon capture and storage is different in the sense that it allows emissions to continue, except you capture those emissions at the point source. So you're stopping emissions from happening and you're not really taking out old emissions at that time period. So the, this is the main difference. And it's really, really critical to, to know this difference because carbon dioxide removal is quite different in that we can actually mitigate past climate emissions or carbon dioxide emissions by removing them and hopefully um, bringing the atmosphere to a carbon dioxide level that is going to be a comfortable place for humanity to live in the future. So really, most of the carbon dioxide removal technologies have focused it on terrestrial or land-based methods. And this is a picture of a direct air capture facility. You may have heard of these. There's lots of these being built. The new um, the, the new bill passed by Congress this past summer is um, really promoting some of this technology and building up some of this technology to scale. And really what this is, is taking direct air capture, taking carbon dioxide removal, taking carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere. Um, there's a lot of other methods in terrestrial CDR. I don't really want to focus on them, but I do want to say there are quite a few limitations to terrestrial CDR, just like there would be for anything. But Really, some of the limitations include regional suitability and resource demands like for um, renewable energy, availability of land and other uses of land that might interfere with carbon dioxide removal. Um, you don't want to push other necessary things that we're doing out of where they're being done just to remove carbon dioxide. Energy and water use requirements, scalability, and then access to CO2 storage and sequestration. So the place where you're actually going to put that CO2 away. And so Really, um, I don't think I need to explain this to this audience, but 71% of the surface of Earth is ocean. So the ocean offers a really interesting place because of its surface area, its vast depth, and the extensive coastlines. And because of these three things, we can interact with the ocean in different ways that we can hopefully potentially remove carbon dioxide from. Also, the ocean is really where most of the carbon dioxide in what I would call Earth's active carbon cycle is found. And this is where carbon dioxide is being moved between reservoirs on the order of um, less than a year to tens to hundreds of years. And there's 38,000 gigatons in the ocean, about um, 860 comparatively in the atmosphere. And then the other reservoir is really soils and land biomass, where there's about 2,000 gigatons. So out of all those three combined, 93% of that is stored in the oceans. Now, the geological, the rock reservoir, really dwarfs all these by orders of magnitude. But that is sort of the slow carbon cycle, right? This is where the carbon is taking tens to hundreds of thousands of years to be cycled between reservoirs. And ultimately, 
it's where a lot of carbon dioxide removal companies are trying to store the carbon as rock because it is there for such long periods of time. <clears throat> so the ocean's potential to store carbon far outseeds other planetary, car planetary carbon sinks. Um, there's also less competition for space, especially in the open ocean. Uh, we can do marine, so marine carbon dioxide removal is MCDR. People also call this ocean carbon dioxide removal. We struggled between what we wanted to call it in this presentation many times, but in a essence, they're referring to the same thing. Um, we can also have um, locally positive things for ecosystems with marine carbon dioxide removal, like ocean acidification mitigation when we add alkalinity. So there are a lot of good potential reasons why marine carbon dioxide removal could be a good thing to do comparatively to other processes. Um, and I think probably the biggest reason why ocean carbon dioxide removal seems like it, it could be a really good thing is that it can act, the oceans can act as the storage vessel themselves. So if you remove carbon dioxide using direct air capture with one of those big fan um, type instruments or uh, the machinery, you have to store it somewhere. You can't just you can't yeah you can't just keep it as condensed gas. You got to put it somewhere. And really, people are trying to put that down into geological reservoirs. With the oceans, if we can store carbon as ocean alkalinity, as inorganic carbon in the ocean, bicarbonate and carbonate ions, we can actually store it for tens to hundreds of thousands of years before it sort of re goes through the cycle of calcification and the precipitation of calcium carbonate, which is really what pulls that out of the oceans. Um, so it really can represent a really large place to exchange carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the oceans. There's a lot of places, there's a lot of surface area where it gets exchanged, but also it really can represent a place where it can be stored as well, which I think is pretty critical. So what are some of the ways that marine carbon dioxide removal could take place. This is from a report, and if you're really interested in this and you haven't really figured out where to start looking into it, I would highly recommend this National Academies for Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine report from 2022 on marine carbon dioxide removal. It goes through really all of the main ways that people are planning to try and do this process. Um, so there's about six or seven, depending on how you slice and dice some things. But Really, they boil down to artificial downwelling and upwelling, deep sea storage, which is just pumping CO2 straight down, which you know, personally I don't think is a great idea, electrochemical processes, which I'll talk in more detail later, marine ecosystems restoration, so restoring blue carbon ecosystems, um, seaweed cultivation, and really biomass, using biomass of some sort to sink organic carbon to the bottom of the ocean. And then there's ocean alkalinity enhancements. Um, so this report really focused on two of these things, ocean alkalinity enhancement and electrochemical processes. And we divided these the way that this report divided them. But in the end, it turned out that they were actually overlapping in some ways with what some enterprises were planning to do or are doing at the moment. But basically, ocean alkalinity enhancement in general is increasing ocean alkalinity to capture and store atmospheric CO2. So we increase alkalinity, it sort of acts like a sponge, allowing the ocean to absorb more carbon dioxide, and it captures it as bicarbonate and carbonate ions, storable for a long period of time. Electrochemical processes are um, techniques that use electrochemistry, usually electrodialysis, to separate seawater or some other brine solution like waste stream from a uh, desalination plant into an acid and a base. And then you can do some interesting things with those acids and bases to try and capture and store CO2. And I'll tell you about those in a second. So this is really what the, the report we worked on for the World Ocean Council focused on. So with OAE or ocean alkalinity enhancement, you can really do it one of two ways. You can add ground up rock to enhance the natural weathering process, or you can add aqueous alkalinity or pre-dissolved alkalinity um, maybe derived from an electrochemical technique or maybe pre-dissolved in a reactor to the ocean. So enhanced weathering is really accelerating the natural weathering process um, that drags uh, carbonate and carbonate ions into the ocean from land by dissolving rock. And there's really a few main ways that people are planning to do this. One of the biggest ones is using a rock called olivine, 
Carbonates are also proposed. Um, some magnesium carbonates are interesting um, candidates for this. And by grinding it up, you're really enhancing that really slow natural weathering process by increasing the surface area of the rock. And if you're strategically putting it in places, um, this isn't marine carbon dioxide removal, but there are a lot of people and companies putting it on farms to take advantage of all the infrastructure there that can enhance carbon dioxide drawdown from the atmosphere. And I'll talk about this company in a second that's doing it in the oceans along coastlines. The other one is the addition of alkalinity as a liquid, and um, you could do this in many ways. Uh, you could put it in the open ocean, but it's going to be hard to track, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And you could also add it to infrastructure that's already discharging high CO2 seawater into the oceans, for instance, through wastewater treatment plants, which are already dealing with large, large amounts of water on a daily basis. I think like 60 some million gallons on a daily basis in the United States alone. And so that is a potential way to capture carbon. The other technique was electrochemical processes. And this is a little more technological in the sense that we're using sort of high-tech equipment. Um, the other process is kind of pretty bare bones and kind of, in my opinion, quite elegant because we're just grinding up rock and enhancing this natural process. And this process has really big potential as well. And really what's going on is you're using energy to split some sort of uh, brine or CO2, or I mean, sorry, so seawater into a acid and a base, usually sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. And you can do one of two things with this. You can add that sodium hydroxide into seawater, increasing the alkalinity, allowing it to absorb more CO2 from the atmosphere. Or you can use interesting ways to take that um, acid, turn all your carbon in seawater into CO2 gas, and capture that gas, recombine the, the um, sodium hydroxide with that, and put CO2-free seawater or low CO2 seawater back into the ocean, which can then reabsorb. So you're not really enhancing alkalinity in that case. You're really just taking that carbon dioxide, and you have to store it somewhere else. Um, with alkalinity creation, you have to deal with the other side of the electrodialysis system, and you have to somehow get rid of that HCL, and there's some innovative ways that people are thinking about doing that, but that is one of the issues with that process. So we did sort of a case study on our four separate enterprises, so startup enterprises that um, are going about doing this in some cases, or planning to do this, and I'll explain where they are in their process and what they're doing in a second. Two of them were really in this OAE pathway. Um, one was sort of a collaboration between two, that was Origin and Planetary Technologies. And then this other one is its own company called Vesta, it used to be Project Vesta. And then there's the electrochemical side and we have Captura there and Ebb. And these two are quite different. Ebb kind of fits in the middle of this taxonomy of electrochemical and OAE. So what are, what are they doing? So. Vesta is basically accelerating the natural weathering process here by grinding up all the rock and they're deploying it on beach faces and they're integrating it into beach renourishment projects. So they've, they've already done this uh, multiple places. They're doing it in Long Island. They've done it in the Dominican Republic where they have experiments going on, where they've put this rock and they've integrated it into a beach renourishment project that's already happening at a certain percentage. And they're monitoring, trying to understand if that's actually drawing up carbon dioxide. The reasoning why beach faces are used here is because the constant wave action will hopefully guide more dissolution of the olivine rock just by the constant working of the, the sand itself. So that's sort of where they're, they're going now. Although I, I do want to say all of these companies have all sorts of ideas and there's not just necessarily one way they're moving, but this is sort of the, the particular thing that they started with. Origin and planetary is a pretty interesting combination. It really starts with origin and origin is not a marine carbon dioxide removal technology. It is really decarbonizing the cement industry by producing carbon-free lime. And the cement industry is actually really important emitter of carbon dioxide. So outside of marine carbon dioxide, this is really critical. But what they do is they create this, this um, carbon-free lime um, 
by heating it and capturing the CO2, storing that CO2 somewhere else. So now we've emitted no carbon dioxide. So this is more like carbon capture and storage, right? But now you have this extra line that you can do something with and you can add that to the oceans, increasing alkalinity and capture more CO2. And so that's kind of the idea there. They're creating a material that can be used to do these alkalinity enhancements in different places. And plant planetary technologies is a group that's working with origin. They're also developing their own um, way of creating this uh, carbon-free alkalinity from mine tailings and doing some electrochemistry. But really what they're doing is putting the alkalinity in the water and trying to create ways to monitor and measure that. And they're using wastewater treatment streams right now as a way to do that. Um, one particular place in the UK has already been done. They did an experiment, I think, in September of last year where they added a bunch of alkalinity to a wastewater treatment plant stream and captured carbon dioxide through that method. Okay, so now into the more electrochemical processes. So Capjura is another startup company that is doing this. Um, and they are kind of doing this technology where they are separating. So they're taking seawater in here. They're pre-treating it, doing electrodialysis. You create your acid in your base. Your acid, you acidify another seawater stream, where then you capture all that carbon dioxide. Um, you have to go store that somewhere now. You can't just let that go back into the ocean because you just redone the whole process. So you have to go store that carbon dioxide. And then they combine the base back in with the seawater stream, bringing the chemistry back, back to normal, and then allow that CO2-free seawater to equilibrate with the um, atmosphere once it's out in the ocean. So that's Capture, what Capture is doing. I'm not actually sure where they are as far as implementing any um, experiments in the field. I know they have a working system and they're wor I think they're working on doing something. I want to say Southern California, don't quote me on that one. And then finally, the last company was Ebb and they're creating these containerized um, electrodialysis systems that are taking in either brine from, from desalination plants or dr seawater directly, doing some electrochemistry and taking that alkalinity, adding it back into the ocean, and then taking off taking that um, HCL and either reselling it to the market or trying to use it in other carbon capture methods, like dissolving olivine rock apparently can help get it pre-treated to capture more alkalinity. So there's some different methods that might be kind of working to combine sort of this alkalinity enhanced weathering with this electrochemistry. Um, but really, they're an electrochemical alkalinity generating enterprise that is doing OA, either doing ocean alkalinity enhancement. So then they're relying on the atmosphere to re-equilibrate with that added alkalinity. So one of the most important things for all, all of these companies is something called MRV. And if you spend any time looking at carbon dioxide removal companies, you've heard this term. And it refers to measurement, reporting, and verification. There's some other nuanced, different terms that people might throw in there um, for the M, the R, or the V. But in general, what it refers to is measuring that the carbon dioxide has been removed to the atmosphere, verifying that through some method, and then reporting it. So really, this is really a very critical step because it connects the place where you're going to sell these carbon credits, which I'm going to talk about in a second, to the science and the actual chemistry that's been done. Um, it ensures that carbon has been removed from the atmosphere to some sort of a degree of certainty, um, maybe to the limits of your model or however you're gonna do this. But um, really, as far as the ocean goes, this is something that really critically needs to be explored and science behind it really needs to be developed. Um, and in essence, actually, most of these startup companies are in some way or another an MRV company because this is the thing that they're selling in the end. And they're really learning how to develop this MRV as part of the process behind whatever each individual company is doing. And some of it might look similar and some of it might look quite different from company to company to company. Okay, so this connects the markets to the product, but what is the market? Is there even a place where these carbon credits can be sold? Why are we doing this? How can these companies even make money? 
So the IPCC forecast that 10 gigatons per year of CDR by 2050 will be needed with increasing amounts in the second half of the century. So right now we're emitting about 35 to 40 gigatons per year. So you can do the math. It's like 25% of our emissions that we're going to need to do if we want to keep um, uh, global warming to a reasonable 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Also, there is estimates that this is going to be a one trillion trillion dollar annual market opportunity by the mid-century, with 15 times growth by 2030, 100 times by 2050. So this is a lot, a lot of money going into this. I can tell you right now, there's probably been on the order of a few billion dollars already invested into carbon dioxide removal from different places. I'll talk a little bit about that more in a second. But in the end, people who are looking at this as an investment opportunity see a large potential for growth. But where are these carbon credits sold? How is it even making money, right? Like that's a really important question. And it's sold on one of two places, the compliance carbon markets, which is a carbon market that's regulated by some authority. So the California cap and trade market is an example of this. And certain industries or companies are given a, an amount of carbon they can emit and they can sell credits back and forth and things like that. This is relatively small. I mean, $899 billion um, in, in total sort of like big market scale, but still much bigger than the voluntary market, which is only at about 2 billion now. And the voluntary carbon market is where carbon credits can be purchased and sold for companies to compensate for their emissions voluntarily. Nobody's telling them they have to do this. Um, and you may have seen some different things about, you know, selling um, carbon credits from forestry and things like that and how they haven't been so great. But really, this is the voluntary carbon market and it's growing and trying to be made better. And hopefully marine carbon dioxide removal is sort of the head of the curve on this. And it's really, I think the goal of a lot of this marine carbon dioxide removal the, these companies and the industry is to sell high quality carbon credits that can be trusted. Um, and so there is a lot of science going behind that. They don't want to sell carbon credits like some of these tree reforestation carbon credits that have been sold for $5 a ton that might not really be removing carbon from the atmosphere. So companies are wanting to buy these voluntary carbon markets. They're looking ahead. They're seeing that carbon is probably going to be regulated at some point and they want to get rid of their emissions, right? And so they are actually, there is a market for that. Um, currently, the market for long duration carbon dioxide removal is severely supply constrained. So that means there's not a lot of it available to buy. Um, this is because there's not a lot of companies doing this and they're really in research and development stage. This is a really cool website. If you're interested in CDR, it's called cdr.fyi. Uh, this is older, so this I pulled off earlier. It, tracks all of the total sales in the voluntary markets and the total amount of carbon dioxide removal delivered. So that's when we've said we've actually captured a ton of carbon dioxide. So about 70,000-ish tons. Um, you can see here about uh, $800,000 of total sales that have been delivered. Um, this is a really cool website to explore if you're interested in the market side of this stuff. The price trend, um, the price is going to go down, hopefully. I'm not going to talk too much about this, except to say that there just tends to be this magic number of $100 per ton that people seem to think is the place where it's going to be economically feasible and potential for companies to, to make money and to actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. This is what uh, 2023, this came out a couple of weeks ago, market map of the voluntary carbon market looks like. So this is from Pure Daughter. So you can start to see all of the different companies and things that are involved from the buy side to the sale side to the supply side. So I'll zoom in on some of these and you can start to see the types of people. So you have corporations buying, right? All these corporations from Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google, Delta, Airbus, all these companies, Disney, are trying to buy carbon credits. You have governmental institutions and NGOs getting in on some of the buying um, you have these things called advanced mar market commitments, and these are really driving some of the R&D in this marketplace. Um, Frontier in particular has about a billion dollars they're investing, um, and Frontier is part of the company Stripe, which does credit card acceptance, and they're doing this climate um, carbon dioxide removal sort of advanced market commitment. So they're putting money out there before they know they're going to actually sell carbon credits or get carbon credits back to stimulate R&D. Um, 
this was done to stimulate production of vaccines in the past, and it worked for low-income countries. So they're trying it with carbon dioxide removal. The project proponents, these are the companies that are actually removing carbon or trying to remove carbon. There's 27 in here, but there's way, way, way more than that. And then there's exchanges where this stuff can be sold. From our study, I kind of compiled a list of all the marine carbon dioxide removal companies. And there is uh, 26 total and six were electrochemical, four were alkalinity, but those didn't even make up half of these companies out there that are proposing to do stuff. 16 were what I would call biomass, which is some sort of growing algae or plankton and sinking it to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so the vast majority are in that space, but that was not really part of our report there. Okay, so I just wanna to talk to you about my key takeaways from this report here. Um, so I came into this as a scientist and I was exposed to a lot of really cool and interesting things that I wouldn't have been just doing some normal science um, or my day-to-day -day science. And so I, I really thought this was, was a really neat and interesting project to see where this, what is called from Silicon Valley, the ecosystem, although we know it's all not a real ecosystem. So this space or whatever you want to call it, this industry is growing. Um, but some of my key takeaways, and I want to emphasize it's my takeaways, not necessarily the takeaways from the project itself. We did come up with a bunch of takeaways, but and mine align with them. But I kind of just wanted to talk to you guys more about this from my perspective as a scientist. The number one thing, it is all happening. My good friend, whenever things started to like start going your direction and start happening, she would always say, Tyler, it's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. This is, I just showed you the, the, the space of this industry and all of the companies involved. It is going on now. There are companies capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There are companies doing things in the marine space to capture carbon dioxide. They're doing large scale experiments. Now is the time to get involved. This is opening a lot of doors, I think, for opportunities outside of traditional job space for, especially for people in carbon, um, sort of carbon industry or carbon science. And it, it's really a place where there's a lot of potential, but it's also really starting to move fast. And now is the time to sort of jump in if you're interested in this. Um, MRV is going to be the critical link between the science and the marketplace, and it's going to be very, very important to get this right. There are already, um, there was a NOAA NOP call that came out to, to ask to get funding that was looking for collaboration between industry and science partners to do this. There was a whole conference about this from NOAA in September. ARPA-E from the Department of Energy is putting out a, a funding call for this. There's nonprofits, one called Seaworthy, that's being started by ocean scientists to report on this. So this, this is a space that's very active, but it's also very important. It's going to involve some degree of modeling. There's no way we're going to be able to measure every amount of carbon molecule removed from any of these processes. So we're going to have to rely on models and their uncertainty to some level. Um, I think transparency and openness are keys to success. And planetary technologies is a good example. They just released their MRV strategy to be publicly consumed on GitHub. So if you're interested in that, you can go look at it. We need community buy-in from multiple stakeholder groups. We need the communities to buy in where these, where these activities are gonna take place. And some of these enterprises are well aware of that. For instance, Project Vesta or Vesta and Planetary are openly interacting with the communities where they're doing the sand um, amendments with olivine and the wastewater treatment plants. We can't lose the message. I think this is just kind of coming from climate change in general. We need to all, we can't let the message be taken over by insidious actors that have other plans that maybe want to buy carbon credits just to like greenwash stuff, right? Like this, this can really work, I think, and it can be really good for climate change, but we've got to make sure that it's, it's not taken advantage of like it has so often in the past with some of this stuff. And then I kind of just made this up here, but we can't let a few bad apples spoil the cider or the apple pie or whatever you want to call it. Um, this is a, a lot of money pouring in here, billions of dollars. Um, there's going to be people that try and take advantage of that and they need to be flushed out, but we can't let that spoil the whole enterprise. We got to keep moving forward, I think. In any case, I just want to acknowledge the people involved with this. Um, Lydia Kaspenberg from ClimateWorks was really key in funding a lot of this. Um, World Ocean Council, Tina and Paul were really great. 
And then Simon Wilson, he was sort of in charge of pulling us all together and Lana and Toby Bryce and myself. Toby was more on the commercial side and I was on the science side. So really cool project. Okay, so now I'm gonna sort of switch gears and we're gonna talk more about science here. And I've got, I'm gonna try and keep this to 10 minutes, but I'm gonna talk about my science and how I think this can be integrated specifically into ocean alkalinity enhancement, because that is kind of what is closer to what I've really worked on in the past as a carbon chemist is looking at alkalinity in different coastal systems. So when asked the question, can the unique chemistry of coastal ecosystems benefit ocean alkalinity enhancement and also vice versa, can OAE benefit ecosystems? So I'm sure you all know the difference between weather and climate. Um, you know, weather is sort of the state of the atmosphere at any given moment in time and place, and climate is the statistics of that weather, right? And so usually over long periods of time, like 30 years or so, we get a climate so we can start to predict what the weather might be like, although within some range of uncertainty. This is for the atmosphere, right? But in the ocean, we have similar things happening. Um, we can think of ocean weather as the state of the ocean, state of seawater at a place in time, in regards to maybe different things than what's happening into the atmosphere, um, some similar things like temperature and heat, but we also have seawater chemistry. We've got carbon chemistry. We've got currents. Um, we've got um, other things that we're dealing with in the ocean that we might not deal with in the atmosphere. And ocean climate is really the, the same sort of concept as in the atmosphere, except it's the average conditions of the seawater over long periods of time. And really, for the most, for for um, most of the open ocean, ocean weather is not very dynamic. It's not changing very much. It's pretty stable, and it's going to closely match what the climate is right. But in coastal ecosystems where you have very shallow um, ecosystems and lots of biological activity, you can have very very dramatic swings in different um, different variations of seawater. Chemistry And here we see daily variations in seawater temperature ranging from 20 to 28 degrees Celsius per day over the course of a week on a coral reef. And you can see similar things in carbon chemistry. Okay, so this is a great movie if you haven't seen it, but quick synopsis, this guy goes and finds this octopus for a year and decides he wants to befriend the octopus and go swimming every single day and experience what this octopus is experiencing. Really, really cool story. But this is one quote that struck me while watching this movie. And it was, it took going in every day to really get to know our environment better. And what he was explaining was ocean weather. It was very, very dynamic. Some days you couldn't see past his hand. Other days it was really clear. And he was experiencing ocean weather firsthand. We experienced atmospheric weather firsthand and we think really nothing of it, right? But the ocean is the same, is doing the same. This was a paper from 2018 in Nature that really kind of was a commentary telling biologists that, hey, you need to pay attention to this because it's important. So I worked with Lydia Kapsenberg on a project where we looked at changes in carbon chemistry across different spatial and temporal scales and how that might impact an organism's uh, ability to deal with ocean acidification. And so you can see the different types of processes across time here and spatial scale ranging from really big um, open ocean seasonal um, and upwelling phytoplankton's blooms and so event scale type things all the way down to the boundary layer around an organism and all these happen on different time scales from seasonal to weekly event scale type things are from daily changes in ph so this is all representing changes in ph and all of this is happening as we change the, the climate, we change the carbon dioxide and the pH of the seawater. So this is from the Hawaii Ocean Time Series, increasing CO2, decreasing pH. So on top of this overall big climatary change, we have these small scale processes happening. And we asked the question, can these be used to help um, find, find uh, populations of things that are vulnerable or less vulnerable? And I'm going to go fast here because I know I'm kind of overgoing on time. But really, we dug into this um, concept of vulnerability, and it has three components. And it really it's the extent to which a species is threatened by climate change. So their sensitivity, which is the degree to which a uh, population or species is depending on the prevailing climate, adaptive capacities of their ability to change, 
And then exposure, what they're exposed to. So are they exposed to more or less ocean acidification dependent on where they are? What we found was that variability didn't really often matter. And this is a lot of what you hear people who are really onto carbon dioxide removal say, and I completely agree, is that we still need to focus on reducing CO2 emissions. This is the primary thing we need to do. But when variability does matter, um, responses are inconsistent. So it's an unreliable solution to look at this, these refugia. But we found one place where variability was actually really important, and it's in the organism's environmental history. So organisms that were exposed to more low pH corrosive conditions were really able to handle uh, changes in ocean acidification better. They had a better adaptive capacity. Um, and if we brought up these ideas of the different types of refugia people might build. And one of them was the small scale operative refugia, which is purposeful CO2 management by either using algae or seagrass to remove carbon dioxide, alkalizing, bubble stripping, but kind of what ocean acidification enhancement or CDR enterprises are proposing to do. So alkalinity is really important. Coastal systems are really important in the alkalinity cycle. This is a great review paper of why that's the case and all the different processes we may or may not be missing in the global alkalinity cycle. Coastal ecosystems are critical. Rivers discharge a lot of alkalinity. So that brings me to sort of my research and trying to understand the alkalinity cycle. And I just wanna give you some examples of how alkalinity changes in coastal systems. This is from a coral reef um, in the Cook Islands, which is in the Pacific Ocean, uh, Rarotonga. And we looked at alkalinity coming from two different sources, from the sediments and from groundwater that was in the actual island itself and discharge. And what we found was that both were sources. So this is radon, which is a signature of groundwater. And you can see alkalinity was increasing with radon at this site. So that means groundwater was pumping alkalinity into the ocean there. We did these chamber incubations too to look at alkalinity on a daily basis. And the chambers produce alkalinity at um, night, but they take it up during the day. And overall, this was the added uh, con contribution of alkalinity flux at this one site. Um, so groundwater, takeaway groundwater can deliver alkalinity and so can coastal sediments from very different processes. Seagrass beds, we also did a study where we compared Mission Bay and uh, in San Diego and Bermuda, and we wanted to look at how alkalinity changed. We found alkalinity was negatively related to salinity in Mission Bay and also had a daily cycle. But overall, the alkalinity and DIC concentrations were related, but differently between the two sites. So even though these were both seagrass dominated sites, they were quite different between the two places. This is a study from Florida um, that my first master's student graduated with uh, a few years ago. And she was looking at alkalinity in mangrove systems. And she found a clear relationship between salinity, so maybe related to groundwater, where alkalinity was actually higher in the groundwater than in offshore seawater. So the groundwater was again, a source of alkalinity. And um, this, what, what really was important was this TA to DIC ratio, which is critical in governing how much carbon dioxide can be taken up in a system. The lower that ratio, the less carbon dioxide and it turned lower salinity. This, this fresh water was also a source of carbon dioxide and alkalinity at the same time. Another study, was looking up and down the coast of Florida here. So this is the South Florida, here's Miami, here's Stewart, Florida, and there's these inlets um, along the, the sort of island that kind of goes along the coast here. And um, Harrison was measuring chemistry. He was another graduate student of mine. And he measured carbonate chemistry at all these inlets. And he found relationships between salinity where a lot of the time these places indicating salt or fresh water was a source of alkalinity. And if we looked at latitude, we found that there was more alkalinity in the lower, so down by Miami areas than in the upper area. So a variety of um, ways alkalinity is introduced across this uh, latitudinal spectrum. And what we thought maybe was that as water flows through the Everglades, it spends longer periods of time on land here, collecting a signal of alkalinity until it's discharged. The Everglades generally kind of flow this way. Anyway, every place was a little bit different, but still lots of sources of alkalinity. So I know I just rushed through those, but I just wanted to show you some bits and pieces of what alkalinity is doing in coastal systems. But 
What about OAE? How can this be used? So there's some interesting ways we could potentially use these unique chemistries to, to make sure that the alkalinity is dissolving or not precipitating calcium carbonates. Also, if we could think about spreading alkalinity in marshes or seagrass beds, that has the potential to keep it stored in one spot, making monitoring, reporting, and verifications. And so I want to end on this one study that was done by Charlie Morass, who's a PhD student at my um, PhD university, Southern Cross. And he did some just bottle experiments of trying to dissolve different types of carbon or different types of alkalinity in to seawater to see what happens. And what he found was if you put too much, you induce this runaway precipitation. So this is added alkalinity in the higher one, you can see falls down real quick. And this one is really stable. This is not really good for carbon dioxide removal because you're actually in the end removing more alkalinity than you're putting in there. And you, you're having the exact opposite effect. You're actually creating more CO2 in the seawater to go back into the atmosphere. He also did a cool experiment where he added um, sodium carbonate, but added it with quartz um, crystals and found that the quartz induced calcification or precipitation to occur. And this was because of the nuclei there. So it's really important to think about how we're adding this alkalinity into the oceans and where we're adding it because we don't want to have this runaway calcification. But it's also important to realize that runaway calcification isn't necessarily the end of the world because you still may be capturing carbon dioxide. And I'm going to rely on this real quick. And I wish I had a little bit more time, but I'm going to just do real quick here between alkalinity here, carbon on the, on the x-axis, alkalinity on the y. These are different processes and how they change carbon and alkalinity together. So biogeochemical processes, calcification draws DIC and alkalinity out of the seawater. And you can see you move across these pH isolines. So this is the pH calculated at any one of these combinations. So you're actually lowering the pH when you do calcification. You're raising it when you do the solution. So let's think about this theoretically from an alkalinity enhancement perspective. So instead of pH, I've got PCO2 in the background here. And remember, the water is going to want to equilibrate back to atmospheric PCO2. And so let's think about if we have a starting place here. We add our alkalinity. It's um, all, now we have a CDR potential, right? We want to equilibrate back to this sort of ISO line of CO2 where we started. But what if we do calcification? We're actually pulling the chemistry down in this two to one ratio, reducing this CDR potential along this ISO line. So that CDR potential becomes smaller, but what you want to notice is it doesn't become negative. So within here is some sort of range of how much you reduce your carbon dioxide removal potential for each amount of calcification that you might have happened. Why is this important? Because adding alkalinity might induce biological organisms to calcify, or it might induce runaway precipitation to occur. We need to get that under control, but biological cal calcification is a good thing and a potential ecosystem benefit. So we can have the best of both worlds. We can get coral reefs to calcify a little bit more, but we can also draw down carbon dioxide. But we have to add carbon-free alkalinity. So calcium carbonate is a little bit harder to do here because you go up in a two-to-one direction, but sodium hydroxide, things like that work really well. Okay, so key takeaways. Unique carbonate chemistry in coastal regions could create conditions where alkalinity enhancement is more effective. We need to do more studying here. We need to do more research. Um, we need a concerted and transparent effort to examine OA impacts on ecosystems and biological systems. We really need to understand it's not necessarily so concerning what the alkalinity and the carbonate and um, bicarbonate ions might do, more concerning what some of the byproducts like iron and other heavy metals that are in these minerals might do if they're re released into these systems. And I think really we can draw on previous ocean acidification research, especially the early OA research that looked into changing the chemistry by either adding sodium hydroxide or adding acids, because that's more similar to what alkalinity enhancement is going to do to the chemistry. And I think someone should write a review paper on that. Um, I don't know if I will ever have the time to do it, but I think it would be great to look at a review paper of how um, those particular experiments differed between maybe just adding or taking out CO2. So, with that, I want to thank you for listening to me. I know I got a little faster, but I think I left a little bit of time for questions, and I would like to open it up for any questions you guys might have.
Okay, can can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So I guess I will moderate the questions. Are there any questions from anyone in the live audience? Yeah. Speaker. Hi, Tyler, Roxanne here. I was curious in those last experiments you described with your student um, looking at adding alkalinity to seawater and talking about runaway calcification is, did you do those experiments in seawater? Because I was kind of under the impression we don't usually see a lot of runaway calcification um, just in the oceans and like times in the geologic past when we do see really high alkalinity. And I don't know how these values compare, but I was just kind of curious. Yeah, so this was done in, um, I, I want to say it was filtered seawater collected. This was done in Australia, so it would have been Pacific seawater. Um, but I think the, the difference there is in the past, you know, the weathering process has delivered alkalinity really slowly to the ocean. So it has time to equilibrate with CO2 naturally. Here, he was literally just dosing it like right there, letting it mix and then following it. So you can see here it's number of days. Yeah. that has been followed and it kind of equilibrates naturally for a little bit but then all of a sudden something happens and this mm -hmm. precipitation just kind of occurs it is most likely related to precipitation nuclei because the saturation state that this is happening at is lower than where we would expect precipitation of aragonite at least and calcite to just happen naturally um so likely and i think this experiment here really shows that nicely because he added those quartz crystals and it induced that um precipitation where when he didn't add those it it didn't happen great that thank you sense. yep okay oh yeah i'm going to come up and Hi, yeah, I've got a question. Um, you talked about um, some of the concerns of maybe trace metals and and some of the maybe unexpected consequences. I'm interested in the in the is it the Vesta project where we're kind of um, adding olivine? Do you know if they have any results yet of the monitoring of some of the trace metals that I know they were doing? You know, I'm not totally up to date on what their current results are, but I know they've done a lot of experimental um, laboratory-based studies looking at how dis dissolution of the olivine might, might affect specific organisms. Sorry, my dog's background. But um, I think um, most of the stuff from what I've talked to them about is that it's not appearing to have any major issues with a, a lot of the organisms they're looking at, at least. In the environment, I think it's a lot harder to track, especially in these open systems where there's so much exchange of pore water and open ocean water in, in the beach faces. I think it's a lot harder to see if there's any, number one, carbon dioxide removal, but also any ecological impact. Great, thank you. So I have a question for you. When you think of those different types of marine CDR, do you think that there's going to be kind of one avenue that will emerge as a dominant avenue, or do you think it's going to be a silver buckshot type scenario where some aspects of the technology will emerge and we'll end up using lots of different tools to take CDR out of the, or to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? What's your sense? No, that's a great question. I think, um, it, it can't just be one. I think we're going to have to rely on a lot of different tools from things we do on land to things we do in the ocean and maybe things we haven't thought of yet because none of, not one of these things is really truly scalable to that gig, 10 gigatons a year that the IPCC says is needed. I mean, that's just a lot, a lot of carbon. And to work your way through the math to get there just using one of these processes is nearly impossible. That being said, I really like ocean alkalinity enhancement because and enhanced weathering just because of the simplicity and the elegance and that we're just grinding up rocks but we really got to be careful with any ecological problems and it's going to be hard to monitor and do mrv on and um but i think the the biggest advantage there is being able to store the carbon itself in the ocean so using the ocean as a storage reservoir yeah cool yeah one question i was Kind of follow up um, 
with you on is like, do you, what is the pushback that you get when you talk to people about ocean alkalinity enhancement? Is there some kind of general critique or um, concerns that are, are raised consistently, or do you think it's perceived more favorably than some of the other geoengineering approaches? You know, there was a report from, I forget which, which country, it was somewhere in Europe, that looked at the, the perception of these different techniques. And, you know, I thought OAU would be perceived relatively well, but um, it was kind of not perceived very well, actually, by the general public. Um, so I think it just depends really on your audience. I think a lot of the pushback from people who know a lot about it comes more about how are we going to do MRV? How are we going to monitor, report, verify, and make sure with some bounds of uncertainty that you're removing carbon dioxide? Um, I think, and this is just a personal antidote, I visited my aunt and uncle after the, the NOAA um, conference on MRV, and I was just explaining all these different techniques. And, you know, the one that really threw them off was taking old biomass from farms, so unused corn and various things that, you know, would normally just be put to decompose somewhere and putting that at the bottom of anoxic ocean basins. And I can kind of see why that might be kind of off-putting. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, I think that's part of why we need to get the community buy-in because if people aren't buying in and aren't thinking that this is a reasonable solution, then a lot of these projects just won't be able to take place because you need to permit them. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm going to pause and take a moment to see if there's anybody I'm missing from the Zoom before I before I ask one last question. <laughs> Let's see, is anyone out there raising their hand? Maybe I can't say no. Okay, cool. Okay, so one um, last question I have for this audience is for students that might maybe motivated by what you're showing us today and inspired to get involved, what would be um, some advice that you might give them about skills that are important to, to cultivate, um, to develop a future in this field? No, that's another great question. Um, well, I think just learning as much as you can about this. There's so much information out there. So many free places to go and look this up and see what's going on in the carbon dioxide removal space. And, and some of these resources are just really, really good. For instance, Ocean Visions, if you're interested in marine carbon dioxide removal, has a whole um, list of different sort of pathways and, and ways to move forward with, for instance, OAE or biomass carbon removal. And I guess um, my advice would just be to learn, start, like try and think from a systems perspective. I think those are, that's the biggest skill is to think from a big picture perspective and use sort of first order analysis and principles to try and think if something sounds good. And if it doesn't sound good based on our really most basic understanding of a system, then that's a good sign that it might not be a good pathway to follow. So um, I guess that's like, for like specific technical skills, anything related to measuring carbon, I think is is going to be really good. And I think there's going to be so many different um, avenues for people to go down as far as future employment with a lot of these different things opening up. Cool. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> and if anybody wants any resources, feel free to email me. I there's. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but there's a, an email list I get, I think every week or so that has new job openings. And literally there's 20 to 50 job openings every week in this space. And, you know, even learning how to code and do things like that, um, how to model uh, is really important. They're looking for people to build um, apps and all sorts of things that go along with these types of companies. Cool. I think it's... Um... Kind of an exciting time to be a student because you know, in only just ten years ago, it was a lot more about documenting the decline, and it seems now that the conversation is shifting towards thinking about positive solutions to this climate crisis. So it's really exciting to to have you come talk to us about that today. Fun to see what you're thinking about and working on. Yeah, I completely agree. I think you know, it's really refreshing. I you know, I went back and I thought about every intro introduction I ever wrote and it's like ocean acidification is bad and it's going to kill a lot of stuff and we need to deal with it and then when you start thinking in 
this perspective of maybe we can actually do something about this. It just is really, really refreshing. And I think it's really what helps drive me to want to learn more about this and do more research in it. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving a seminar with us today. Thanks so much, round of applause. <laughs>